All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Monday Night Magic. Tonight is June 12th, 2023, and your favorite epigenetic geeks, Ken Close and myself, will be presenting this evening on the topic of rediscovering our human nature. Mm. Yeah. That's, a that's a big topic. So, Ken, tell us what that means to you, rediscovering our human nature. Well, you know, I, we have, there's a natural order to everything. And if, if, if we allow this, this order to, um, to do its work, to have its way with us, I guess you might say, um, then this analytical mind will get out of the way and it will make a lot of, of, of much more um, healthy choices. So the problem is, is that we have, we've come into a instant gratification kind of society. We we're a bit overstimulated by certain um, content. Um, you know, the, the, the screens we're on right now. I mean, we're on a screen right now, but the screens are used for television for our smart devices have a screen on them. Lots of content being fed into these minds through our senses. And, and we've evolved. I don't know if it's even maybe a, a portion of de-evolution, but we have changed into a form of um, of of less than natural state. In other words, what we used to do in the early 1900s, such as growing our own food, right, sowing our own oats, <laughs> um, we don't do anymore. I mean, you can go to the grocery store and get pretty much anything you want. Uh, but the 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 difference in the ingredients, I should say the the contents within that same vegetable or, or produce from this year versus just 20 years ago, you know, it, it's got less than half of the nutrient content that it used to have. It's just really crazy about the, what we're putting in our bodies. And it's not just what we're ingesting uh, through our meals, but what we're ingesting through our, uh, you know, what we watch on television, right? The 1900s, how many people stood or stayed inside watching TV. Well, we didn't have it for, <laughs> right? But, right? But that didn't happen. And so these bodies were built um, today versus less. And, and don't get me wrong, evolution still allows for the body to survive in this environment. But does it allow it to thrive in this environment? Are we actually thriving? Or are we just kind of surviving? And, and more people are living uh, the body is alive for longer years, but they're not living in this body for, for a better year, every year after year. It's not the quality of life is not the same. So this getting back to our human nature, there are some natural states of these minds, of these brains for various tasks uh, within what we do. We have this, this beta brainwave frequency that says analyze learn there's nothing wrong with it we're learning during that time but it's the analytical brain the alpha brain the more imaginative daydreamer right brain uh, we've got theta and delta and then into gamma these are all sleep states as we move into more of a subconscious realm but too often when I say too often, I'm talking about probably 90% of the day, we're in the analytical beta brain, you know, looking at all the content that's coming into these senses as, um, as most of the time, something valuable, useful, necessary. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what to do with it. And uh, that's not so much uh, the natural state. Um, creative state this is this humans these humans that are um in that more alpha state they're more creative imaginative um and and able to uh literally um heal these bodies a little bit more than than they are in that um fight or flight mechanism so our natural state uh is again part of where the spirit lives Right. I mean, you guys, uh, any, any meditators out there, 
um, or even even prayer. Prayer is another state of you know meditation. Um, it depends on how you're praying. I mean, if you you know you're praying for something, is a little bit different than just creating a state of of uh, love and nurturing within the body. But we've gone away from. Uh, we're kind of a unique group here, by the way, you guys, I, I feel like a lot of us here are, uh, are not the norm in the world. I mean, we, we tend to gravitate to our spiritual side. We tend to like, you, I saw a lot of you guys raise your hand. I meditate, you know, uh, many of you do more homeopathic and natural things within your life. And, and that's awesome, but we're a min a, a minority, <laughs> of the world literally there's less of folks that are doing that and we're trying to learn how to even do it better right to go to the next level what's the next level of of being uh within our nature and today somewhere around the early 1900s the homeopathic remedies um started to get a bad rep but it was done because there was a study done to find out um, the more around the pharmaceuticals, um, there was a study done to find out difficulties within these bodies out there and, and build chemistry, chemicals to start to fix that. And, and as that pharmaceutical regiment started to increase and get stronger, then it looked at what's the biggest competitors out there. And it's these, these natural home remedies. And so a campaign to a slander campaign, I guess you might be, uh, you know, a, uh, a uh, dark campaign against all kinds of forms of, of healing that wasn't um, within the modern, that modern medical model. So um, things around frequency, you know, the, the microcurrent technologies was literally around from in the 1920s. You should have seen the machines that generated those micro. They were huge, huge machines. I mean, now we got this little guy we can wear on our on our belt loop or on our pocket or around our neck. But then these microcurrent devices were huge, and they could adjust the frequencies of these great big knobs, <laughs> and it was it was great, right? But what happened was is that technology was deemed pseudoscience, right? It was deemed um, uh, unhealthy or uh, unnatural. Um, it was deemed against the uh, the medical model that was being built. So a lot of the the platforms that would provide these kind of treatments um, was shunned and even made illegal. So that kind of started that de-evolution of of human nature or some of these more naturopathic systems. Uh, it started to lessen their uh, their presence within our world. And so as we started building this medical model, you know, science came around and started proving this worked and that worked and studies around drugs. And I, don't, I won't really talk about how drug studies are, are created, but uh, more and more of the chemistry started to take place of, of nature. And we were able to synthesize almost anything right and and that's what was happening and these these natural remedies started to get pushed away and this allowance within us um to give our power away to say okay you're a scientist you know you wear a white coat you got this name badge a certificate on the wall you must have worthy information and and uh th these doctors started to dictate the health of you know, uh, of everybody, like you had to go to the doctor to find out if you were healthy, right? They get a checkup every year, make sure you're, you're okay. Um, and that was the authority was within uh, this, this field of medicine. And so um, what happened after that was a, almost a, a complete surrender of our own power. We got very complacent with a system um, that was the, the medical model. And then what happened was a, a formulation of buffering symptoms as opposed to healing anymore. And there was a, uh, there was, there's a lot of tracking around 
you know, from the, the CDC and, and other regulatory systems that take a look at, um, they just compile data uh, and look at causes of death and, and, um, and tendencies within disease patterns. And, you know, there was a, a really big uproar when, what, 3,500 people died in the 9-11 tragedy right? This entire country went to war um, because of that event. And yet in the, uh, uh, the Journal of American Medicine, the association says that the number one killer of, of certain demographics is actually what's called um, MD-directed therapies, treatments, medical doctor treatments, right? Um, and from the publication itself shows uh, 15,000 Medicaid, Medicare patients die every month. Not just that 3,500 people that were devastated, died, we lost in that tragedy of 9-11. But every month, there are uh, people, Medicare, Medicaid, pay, uh, insurance people, um, members that die from a medical treatment. Now, what's that demographic? I mean, Medicaid, Medicare, that's a great benefit for folks. Um, ones in high corporate structures that have these elaborate insurance programs and plans, right? They have a different um, benefit package. So why is it that they're not amongst that 15,000? I, I, I mean, we can do our own analysis, but where the high money is, then quality may be a little bit different. And so I'm just saying that what, what we believe is safe, you know, um, especially, you know, if, if you've got Medicare, Medicaid, maybe that's a certain age group, right? And you're dependent upon that. Um, and we feel like that's where we're going to be safe. And yet that high number of folks that are, that are dying, right, every year. And it's, it's such an enormous number. Third leading cause of death. Third leading cause of death. <laughs> so this is an unnatural state. This is where we've given our power away. We've, we've become dependent on something outside of us. And I'm not saying that the medical model isn't amazing for when you need, when you need a life-saving treatment, you know, something like you, a laceration, a broken bone, an accident, some kind of instantaneous damage to the body. The medical model, the science we have is tremendous in terms of healing, but chronic, long-term conditions are where I think we're just missing the boat in terms of how we heal. So what we're going to talk about tonight is getting back to nature. And when we're trying to find our human nature, we've got to take into account these amazing thought factories, <laughs> these minds of ours, uh, because in epigenetics, as Lori says, your favorite epigenetic geeks, right? <laughs> In epigenetics, it is the energy, the energy signaling process outside of the cell, outside of the, the, the creation of these bodies that influences the gene. And, and epigenetics states that it is the environment that signals the gene. So... I mean, there's many, many studies, and, and I love Dr. Bruce Lipton's work. You know, it's the uh, how the the environment in, it dictates the gene expression. Um, you can study his work; it's a great uh, way of understanding what I'm talking about. But the moment that we have a thought, a belief, let's just say that's that I'm I'm a I'm a Medicaid member, and I use that insurance process, and I I have to look for very specific practitioners that will take my insurance, don't I? If I want to have this medical 
treatment. And then, so that's a demographic already that is created by um, a specific income level. Right? And so I go there, I get recommendations from these practitioners, and, and I believe it is law. So the moment that a doctor says to us, to you, or someone that you believe highly in, so let's say, you know, it's a, it's a family member that is um, some form of practitioner, and they tell you that, uh, you know, hey, your symptoms are X, Y, Z. You put enough value in that, the mind goes to work to make sure it's true. The, the, the signaling information, the signaling frequency from the mind, from the thought process into our entire system, the body itself, starts to make sure that the body matches the thought and the belief process. <clears throat> so to get healthy, to heal, is different than to believe in a diagnosis. Because a diagnosis, I, I, I've heard this over and over again, is in a lot of cases, a, a death sentence, especially when it comes to some of the statistics that I've been uh, researching in terms of cancer, is that <clears throat> patients that, are, that are, are diagnosed and they're preparing for their first treatment, you know, one of the conventional models of treatment, which is chemo or whatever, <clears throat> and they're on their way to the doctor's office and become nauseous because they read the pamphlet that said 90% of patients having chemo experience nausea due to the treatment, hair loss due to the treatment, right? All of these symptoms due to the treatment. And they're on their way to the treatment and feeling sick to their stomach, okay? So maybe kind of some of you can relate to ever having so much stress in your life, worrying about some condition, some thing that you had to do that you really didn't want to do and resisting and felt nauseous, felt sick, felt so debilitated in your body because of just a thought, because of not even actually doing it yet, but anticipating doing it. And therefore the body becomes the expression of the thought. And I want you to understand something. There's a process a very distinct process. And, and even though we're justified, and I know none, none of you guys here um, complain about anything or, or even get on board with any drama, I know, but somebody you know might be on board with drama or may have some complaint about something. And so you may be able to see them and relate to this. But the, the moment that we have a belief about anything, then the body has to match the mind. And for there to be a body at all, this physical sense of, of body and space and time, in order for there to be it at all, there must be a consciousness that houses this mind. It, the consciousness has got to be in here somewhere, right? I mean, one who is unconscious, maybe in a coma, right? There's still a body there, but how many times have you heard scientific studies that ones that are in a coma still can hear their environment, right? Still aware of their surroundings, but yet in a state of theta, completely asleep, but they can still be aware. And one of my other favorite authors is Anita Morjani, who writes the book called Dying to Be Me. She actually has two books, Anita Morjani, one book called Dying to Be Me, and the other one called What If This Is Heaven? So she went through an experience where she was, her body was so riddled with cancer that her body function actually stopped. She literally died and then came back and wrote a book about it. Now, she's extremely descriptive um, in her way of telling the story of what she experienced on the other side. In other words, in that full dead state, right? So no heartbeat, no respiration, but what's still active? The mind. And so the awareness goes a hundredfold. It, there is no separation in that state of oneness. This is where the, the understanding of you, of where you go, <laughs> is a state of oneness 
where you don't know where you end and everything else begins. It's like a, it's like a, a beautiful understanding of all space and time. And so she does a great job of describing exactly what that's like. And she could hear what was going on in the room and out of the room where she was on the table. She was, she was, her body was dead. She could see, hear, and understand, not just in that present moment, but the past and future. And in that moment, there was still a consciousness and there was a choice point she had. She talks about this choice point and realized that there was more work that she needed to do. And so she was offered the opportunity to come back. And she did. And when she came back into that body, this divine intelligence that creates that 800,000 cells per second I've talked about came with her and realigned every system within her body, rid the body of cancer. Now, how is that within the medical model? How is that within the medical model? How does that show up in the textbooks that they learn in, in uh, medical school? You know, where is that written out and explained to those up and coming doctors during their internship? It's not. It's not. It's never put out there in its, in its detail, nor its entirety. However, it's done over and over and over and over in our world um, with similar stories from people moving from the living state to what they classify as dead and then back, right? Um, so there's a question here. Give me the, the book. What was the, the, the name of the book is Anita. It's, it's dying to be me, dying to be me. Just Google dying to be me and it'll show you Anita Morjani. That's M-O-O-R-A-J. It's the I-N-E, I think, something like that. Anita Morjani. So uh, dying to be me. And it's uh, it will give you a new understanding about what, what awareness or consciousness um, and a, a divine intelligence within these bodies really is all about. If we all had that understanding, not just understanding, but an undying belief, a true diligent belief around what these bodies, this divine intelligence that orchestrates 800,000 cells per second, and you've heard me talk about that in this second and this second and this second, and we can't stop that. I mean, would you want to? <laughs> I don't know that anybody would want to. But you, you, we don't stop that process. But it is happening whether we're awake, asleep, angry, happy, frustrated, doesn't matter. It's happening anytime. And the energy that's writing to that genetic code is with, within our belief structure. So the brain is an organ, no different than the eyeball or the kidney or the heart. It's an organ. It is not the mind. The brain at work is the mind, right? The brain at work is the mind. And the body in action is your emotion. That's the feeling of your life. The mind is the analytical processing of your life. And the two need to combine to show you an experience. So if we understood how to operate these minds and get back into more of a natural state. Nature, nature has uh, a different feel, a different sound, um, a different awareness than what we've moved into. Once upon a time, we didn't actually have a spoken language, right? Once upon a time, how did we communicate? If we didn't have a spoken language, how did we communicate? Through ceremony. Right? We would dance, we would chant, you know, we would act out the, the hunting party we we're just on or the wedding ceremony that we're involved in. We would do these things with these bodies in a natural state and it would create a state of mind. Right? Indigenous tribes, uh, prior to consummating a marriage, a bride and a groom had to go on a spirit walk. They would do this, this ceremony. 
and they would each individually go on a spirit walk and they would go out into nature meditate and and internally create the contribution to the tribe aka their offspring they would create the best version of their child right individually like i want the medicine man or i want the chief of the uh, of the tribe or i you know and they would see themselves in concert with this child raising this child to become this new leader uh, and then being within the 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 tribe with their child as this new leader and so proud and all the feelings that would go along with that and then they would come back together and the wedding ceremony would complete and they would commence they would uh, create this child right now we now know science is proven and we talked about this on one of our calls science is proven within well it's new but the older ideas was within three generations Three generations back was content that was influencing the present tense. Now it's showing way back, even 14 generations, that there's content from that time that's moving forward along the chain within you. Now I'm going to tell you another little deeper secret to the understanding of epigenetics. When we move into the gene keys, if you've ever looked into the gene keys or any of that process, we now know that every gene within these bodies, every cell, every, every expression within these bodies has the entire code, not for just humans, but for life itself. Life itself. Plants, animals, everything within this gene key understanding. So we all came from the same thing, oneness. <laughs> we all came from source. Everything you see came from source. And Anita Mojani talks about when you get back to that space, you're like, woof, okay, this three-dimensional stuff is nothing. <laughs> I got this. So, uh, so understanding a little bit more about where this mind is interfacing, what the thought process is energetically creating. Every thought we have has meaning. And, and these, these minds assign it to some category or some pattern. Uh, so, Laura, you want to expand on some of that? Wow. So, just to summarize what he was saying, we went to war because 3,500 people died in 9-11. And yet, we have 250,000 Americans dying each year from medical error, and nobody's talking about it. What in the world is going on here? Well, let's, let's, let's really think about it. We have a medical model that is most of it, a traditional medical model based on big pharma. And when did big pharma start? Penicillin was a big um, major contributor to that. What did penicillin do? It fought infections. So our medical model has pretty much been involved in treating infectious diseases. Today, and I don't want to stop before I move forward. Let me just think about that for a minute. That's a 10 to 14 day treatment, okay? So we're giving someone these drugs, which are really potent and powerful for 10 to 14 days. Now let's fast forward to where we are with disease patterns today. And most of the disease patterns we have are just chronic issues. So somebody's in chronic pain. They want to put them on gabapentin. For how long? Forever. <laughs> so meanwhile, now we're starting to destroy the liver. In the midst of all of that, we are putting toxic chemicals into the body all in the name of big pharma staying in business. And so the, we are so blessed that in this day and age, we have Healy's, we have Mag Healy's, we have all the awareness of holistic health and wellness that we have. So your number one job is to take your power back. 
-hmm. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but spread the, spread the word on this. Encourage your friends, your family, your loved ones who are really haven't like come to this side of the street yet to take their power back because they're giving their power to a model that is not treating root cause. And if we look at that, if we look at that, so, so as Lori's saying, we taking our power back and, and, and really giving uh, our loved ones uh, this concept, this idea, a lot of times, you know, like in my world, you know, oh, that's just dad, you know, he's just talking about, the, you know, epigenetics. That's just my dad. You know, my kids sometimes are like that, right? I, they hear it over and over again. But the cool thing is they hear it over and over again. It's still part of their model, right? When they start making decisions down the road, it's just, it's still part of their model. So I may not see it. They may not be totally attentive to what I'm saying right now. They might be daydreaming or I think they're daydreaming, but their consciousness is still taken in this content. So never discount your words when it comes to speaking this understanding, this information. Don't discount it. You may be speaking to someone that looks like deer in headlights, right? But I promise you, their consciousness is absorbing, absorbing this because part of what we're going to talk about tonight also is, is the words, is the information coming into our senses. Whether you're doing it on purpose or by accident, uh, just right now, anyone with an earshot of what we're talking about is, is getting an influence in their consciousness. So you might have little ones in the background or you might have neighbors across, you know, across the hall, whatever. If they're hearing my voice, whether they're doing something else or not because there's certain senses that we have that don't ever shut off right there's two of them well there's three but there's two of them one is the olfactory nerve our sense of smell never shuts off right you can smell smoke and you'll wake right up right and you're dead sleep number two is our audio signal the ears never shut off those of you that are parents you understand that when a crying baby's going off at two in the morning or three in the morning right you know you can hear it right you can hear that the other sense is actually our spiritual sense never does shut off um it's always aware uh but those are the two that are really really on all the time so the audio signal going into our into our minds going into the brain right the ear itself and uh the fibers within the nose uh, they're just collectors. They're just um, parts of the system that takes and converts certain uh, types of information into another type of information, electrical pulses for the brain to understand. So when we hear something or we smell something, uh, it, it's, it's, when we smell something, it's chemistry and we, we, we pick up information based on what we've assigned, how we've assigned meaning to that. Somewhere in our life, we smelled smoke and we associated it with fire. Right. If you'd never done that before and you're, you know, 40, 50 years old and sound asleep and a fire breaks out, you wouldn't know that that was harmful so much different than if you've had experience and assigned meaning of it being dangerous. So there are words out there, folks. There are statements out there that we don't even know are dangerous, but they are. And, and there's three big ones that I want to talk about because you can't turn the ears off. No matter if you hear these statements in a song, see them on television, or someone in a distance in the room that you're in is speaking them, you'll still hear them. Or if you're saying them yourself, because when you say a word, obviously you're putting, um, you're putting very diligent neural transmitters together in, in synaptic connections so you can make the mouth move and the air go through your vocal cords and formulate the words and all that. There's a lot going on. But there are three statements that when we, when we say them or we hear them have huge implications on our genetic codes. Number one, I can't. I can't. I can't make more money. I can't find a relationship. I, I can't lift that rock. I can't. Because it's a definitive statement that remember what I said. When you have a thought, there must be a consciousness to propagate the three-dimensional matter of body. 
So that consciousness is on board with, I can't. And so the body will just get on board, says, okay, I can't, I'm in 800,000 cells per second. I can't, you got it. I'm in, I'm with you mind. And so the body starts to become the, I can't of whatever the, after that is, is, is followed there. So now I know you guys have said, well, I do a vision board or I have positive statements and I can say, I can, right? That's, that's really on the opposite side of, I can't, isn't it? However, there is the mind that is reasonable, right? There's what's called cognitive dissonance. <laughs> so when there's a 500 pound boulder right there and you say, I can't lift it. And then you said, yes, I can. Right. And you go to attempt it and the body like, yeah, no, you can't. Well, that's cognitive dissonance. So that's a far stretch between the I can't and I can. So we have to find these middle grounds for these three statements I'm going to talk about, because those are the spaces in which we can hack um, this new self. So instead of I can't, it could be I could try. I could try. Because what happens if you see that 500 pound rock and you say, well, I could try. And the body says, I'm in, I'm in, I'll try. And you go over there and you give it some effort and it moves. <laughs> Woo, man, you know, that empowers the body to the next level, right? And I don't know if you've ever seen this anywhere out there or heard this, but there are tremendous acts of strength that happen when the mind goes offline and gets and disappears from the analytical side and moves right over into the creative side and people have lifted cars off of their loved one right right this is true phenomenon so the same body that couldn't lift 500 pounds now all of a sudden is lifting 2000 or 2500 or 2 tons how is that possible because it's all energy it's all energy. The only thing that separates the energy of doing and not doing is its frequency. And the body will get on board with doing as long as the mind does. This is, this is our hack, folks. This is our hack. So that's, that's, part the of power, of, that's the power of intention, Ken. Because that mother, right? There's no way that mother's going to sit back and watch her kid get hurt or die. Mm -mm. So... She's going to be able to accomplish whatever it is to stop that. That, folks, is the power of intention. And that's why when you're working with your Heelys, you really have to be setting that solid and that clear of an intention. Absolutely. And, and, you, and it's, it's not the analytic, analytical mind that's lifting that weight. It's not the analytical mind. Because the analytical mind is going to say, I can't, right? It's going to look at all the evidence you've ever had in your life, just like like the smell of smoke and the evidence of, of that it's associated with fire. And it's going to look at this load out there and assign meaning to it as it being beyond your capability. And the body's going to be, get on board with it. That's the analytical. That's the beta brain, the beta brain. But I promise you, when one is in that state of, 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 of love for their child, and I'm determination to save their life, that rewrites all of that analytics and goes right into the creative sense of the body. This is where the divine intelligence lives, okay? The divine intelligence I'm talking about that recreates those 800,000 cells per second, it's in the creative brain, the creative side, not the analytical, because you're not analyzing how to do it. It's doing it itself. So the other part of the counter to I can't um, We've got, I, I could try. The other one would be, um, I may be able to. I may be able to. It's, it's, it's different than I can, right? Not as far out left wing as I can because I'm in the midst of something I don't really don't believe I can. But it's maybe I'd be able to. Maybe I'd be able to. Or I wonder if I can. Because that puts curiosity. What's curiosity? creative brainwave state <laughs> it puts cre creative brainwaves back online okay so we're not going all the way over to the i can which is way left wing <laughs> and we're just kind of migrating ourselves into a more 
capable state, way more capable than I can. So that's number one. Number two of the one of some of the most damaging false beliefs is I want. I want. What is the state of want? The state of want is the state of not having. The state of want is the state of lack. When I want something, it has to be cognitively understood within my awareness that I do not have it. And so if I cognitively know in my, even my subconscious mind, I do not have it, that means it's going to always be within, barely within arm's reach. It's going to be outside of you because it's a want, not a have. It's not a have. So having is a whole different other side of wanting, isn't it? Okay, so what do we do? How do we bridge from I want to I have? Like, I have a million dollars. Well, if you don't, <laughs> right, the mind's going to say, you do not. <laughs> so how do you bridge that gap? But it's, 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 you start setting the stage for having. So in other words, a million dollars is my goal. A million dollars is my goal, right? What's it like? Or I should say, what do I do as a person with a million dollars? I'm just using money, by the way, folks. It's one of those things that most people gravitate towards. But what do I do with this relationship that I've dreamed of? Where do we go? How do we dress? What do we talk about? You're creating this state of having, not the state of want. Because to have a conversation with someone of the caliber of relationship that you desire means that you have it. Remember what I said, the body doesn't know the difference <laughs> between something you make up in your mind or something that you have in your three-dimensional space. And to do that masterminding with this partner, oh, and by the way, I'll tell you, a brilliant author in masterminding uh, was Napoleon Hill. If you guys know any of Napoleon Hill's work, he was brilliant at masterminding. And he wrote a book I think you'd be interested in. Um, it's called Interview with the Devil. Oh, no, Outwitting the Devil. Sorry. It's called Outwitting the Devil. Now, it's not a religious book, but... He was brilliant at masterminding. He could actually sit in conversation with Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, uh, uh, Bill Crosby at the same time. You know, he could be that person and have a dialect, an intellectual dialect, with these people because he could project who they were, and then have his own personality and have conversation. So this book, Outwitting the Devil, it's got an amazing backstory. It was hidden, buried for over 70 years because of the fear of it being published in our world. Now, you got to understand the backstory to this is um, Napoleon Hill's wife worked for the church. So think of a title, Outwitting the Devil, what that would do to the uh, church, right? So... She made him promise to never publish that book. And he, he kept his word. He buried it. It wasn't until after he passed away and then she passed away and her sister took on the legacy of not publishing that book. And when she passed away, her husband said, no, this book has to be written. It has to be published. So it was like, it took three people to pass away before that book ever came around. 70, oh, 70 plus years, outwitting the devil. So when we become this mastermind with ourselves, right? And we have a dialogue with the person we do want to be, and that's going to be significant in a little bit. We have a dialogue with someone that we do want to be. That is where we create a state of having instead of saying, I want, I, I, I have this state. We create this entire life model in the mind. And the body starts building the genetic codes cell by cell, 800,000 per second for your body to actually move into that state. Now, let me tell you how that other part of that works. There's a system of information highway called the reticular activating system. It's this 
bundle of, of nerves and a network of information between the brain and body. And the reticular activating system processes 400 billion bits of information per second. 400, with a B, 400 billion bits of information per second. Now, our awareness, everything you guys are hearing, tasting, smelling, feeling, ingesting right now, is only 2,000 bits. 2,000. But the reticular activating system processes 400 billion. There's a lot going on in the background that we're not cognitive of. However, still influencing this organism. So when I say that I create a state of having instead of a state of want, the other 399 billion bits of information starts to direct the organism in very mechanical, methodical, and, and specific ways so that the body sees an opportunity of having. The body feels an opportunity of having. The body has uh, an experience of having. What? If we have the statement of, I want, the body, the reticular activating system keeps you in the state of wanting, moves the body over here so you want it and don't have it. So you want it over there and don't have it. Constantly, this is the process. This intelligence that we have is phenomenal. And the power for us to wield it is here within. It's not out there. It's not in, those, it's not in some practitioner to say that you're healthy, you're not healthy. The reason I'm telling you this is because of how we get back into nature, how we get back to the natural state of who we are, the creative state of who we are, the genetic architect of who we are. And so the last piece of these statements that are oh so dangerous is I need. I need. What's the state of neediness? <laughs> right? I need this. I need a relationship. I need a million dollars. I need a healthy body. None of that's true. None of that's true. But yet we say it. And that, that vocabulary, again, starts to create a needy body. I'm not saying that the, any of these statements are wrong. I'm just, I want you to understand in a deep, deep level from a subconscious model what those statements are creating. And I'm going to tell you another little hint. Like I said earlier, anyone within earshot of my of what I'm saying is is getting this information. Same as if you're in earshot of a song that says "I need," "I want," "I can't." Right? Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You know, we all love to listen to love songs, right? But think about the best love songs of all time are like so codependent. I can't live without you, right? <laughs> or they're about people who have broken up. And so you're listening to this and what are you going to attract? Someone who's needy, someone who's gonna break your heart or how about country music, <laughs> right? That oh my goodness. Cool. I mean, we all love it, but <laughs> whining and just really, pulling at your emotions and taking you way down. I was, I was telling Ken earlier, one of the reasons I absolutely positively still to this day love disco music is it's all about the beat and the music. You, you don't even hardly hear the words. You just are out there dancing and moving and getting into that space of being happy. And it's you're loving the music as much as you love those love songs or that country music, but it's not bringing you down. Mm -hmm. So it's super important. Like what, what music are you listening to? What are you programming into Pandora? And for heaven's sakes, if you have something like Pandora, which so many of us do these days, please make sure it's ad free. Because did you know that after 6 p.m. in the evening, 65% of the ads are drug related? Have you ever seen that? In the, it's like, if you're watching public television, every, what, 30 seconds, there's an ad about some medical thing? Yes, absolutely. And, and just this past weekend, I heard someone say that they, they timed a 60-second commercial 
pharmaceutical commercial. And 75% of the time, that's 45 seconds, was actually about all the horrible symptoms that you were going to get from taking that drug. The so 15 effects. seconds on what it's helping with and 45 seconds on how it can kill you. The side effects, yeah. Right? <laughs> so here's my little hack. Instead of watching regular TV, and my sister just thinks I'm crazy when I tell her this, I watch the Hallmark Movie Channel. She's like, well, you always know how it's gonna end. And I said, precisely. I'm not gonna go to sleep in a state of chaos. I'm not gonna go to, in a, to sleep in a state of, oh my God, I wish that this and that had happened instead. I know they're gonna live happily ever after. But I am then in that vibrational frequency myself. It's positive, it's uplifting. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, it's not just Hallmark. I mean, I'm, I'm using that as that is my bad habit. That's my, not my bad habit. That's my way to unwind and know that I'm not going to have my subconscious placed in a negative space. So, so and you really got to think, right? What are you watching? What are you listening to? What's moving you emotionally and how is it moving you? Well, remember I said earlier, once upon a time, we didn't have screens. We didn't have TV. We didn't have this, 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 you know, attention catching box that can be, uh, I, I, I will admit if, if there's something on TV and I'm watching it, it, it has my attention. I like how many of you guys can fall asleep during a movie? I can't, <laughs> I mean, that's a bad statement. I don't, I don't fall asleep during a movie because why my awareness is turned on. You know, I I'm in this creative state. I'm like in wonder. Right. What's going on? And even if you watch the same thing, like Lori's talking about watching a Hallmark thing over and over again, it's never the same twice because you're not the same person. How many of you ever wrote, read a book more than once and you found new content, right? Or you watched a movie more than once and you saw, oh, I don't remember that scene, right? It's because the reticular activating system for four seconds went somewhere else, right? And, and took you with it during that scene. And the next time you watch it, you're present. And you see the scene. So every time you do something, you're a new version of yourself. And it's not going to be quite the same experience. You may have some familiarity around it, but it won't be the exact same. So when we're, when we're watching a box, um, I want you to understand. So once upon a time, we as humans within this brain, within this model, we're both predator and prey, right? Once upon a time. And so the the optic system is highly keen on movement and so when something moves and there's a reason that i'm using my hands as i move my hands i capture your attention <laughs> right because that's a survival mechanism when when we see moving things we hone in on it like you may have seen uh somebody here on the screen moving walking around and who's where were you looking right <laughs> where were you looking were you looking at that person moving around? But here's what happens when we're in conversation with somebody. You could be sitting on, uh, at a, in a beautiful setting, having a picnic on the beach with a, a, the most captivating human and a bird flies by. Right? <laughs> right. What do we do? That's because movement catches our subconscious awareness and draws the body to make sure it's safe. Three times per second, that subconscious mind that reticular activating system is saying safe not safe safe not safe three times a second and movement is the number one item that says not safe not safe so in order for us to survive we we pay attention to that all right uh it's not a bad thing don't you know don't think any of what we're talking about tonight is a bad thing the i can't i need i want those are not bad things we'll catch ourselves i caught myself earlier I, I can't this or I can't that. I, but, but don't stay there. How many times do you have a thought that you rehearse over and over and over again in your mind? And all of a sudden, it's a week later and you're still rehearsing the same content, right? Or a month later or some, sometimes there is an experience that generates a thought, a belief that was such a traumatic event that we don't get over it for decades, right? That is where trauma is, is deeply seated within our consciousness it we rehearse it 
and it starts to limit our abilities or our uh, willingness uh, to do certain things in our lives. So in taking our power back, in getting back to nature, if we want to get back to nature, some of the most important aspects is to take time away from thought. Take time away from thought. Because we give a lot of time to our thoughts, right? We pay attention to our thoughts. And those thoughts run away with us over and over. We rehearse them. Have you ever found yourself saying the same thing over and over again in your head? You know, a couple times, a few times, a hundred times. <laughs> Neuroscience says that 90% of the thoughts you have every day are the same as yesterday. 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day and up to 90% are the same ones as yesterday. So that's just what science says. Now, we can hack that. We can hack that. We can change that. But it requires diligence. It requires awareness. That's it. Be aware of what you're thinking about. Think about what you think about. Right? That's a simple thing to do. Think about what you think about. Start practicing just that. What am I thinking about? I get this question all the time. What are you thinking about? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I, seriously, and when you can get to the point where you can go, I'm not thinking about anything, that's your creative sweet spot and practice it, practice it. And, and to do this in meditation, I, I, I do practice this, by the way, um, is to sit in quiet, no music, no nothing, and allow my mind to relax. And the moment it starts to think about something, nope, relax. Just nothing, just nothing. And, and, if you can do that for five seconds, you've accomplished something very big. Then do it again for five seconds. Move it into 10 seconds. Just continue to move it up. Move it up. Move it up. And the better you get at that, the more you're able to stay within that creative sense of you and outside of the analytical sense of you. So as we talked about music a little bit, uh, music without words is another amazing tool uh, to, to move you into a new state of creativity. Remember I said, anything that has words, it's going in unchecked right into the system that's on all the time. Um, television is another one. Be very mindful of what you watch. You know, just, I'm not saying don't watch television. I'll be honest, I don't watch television very much. And, and literally when I'm driving, I rarely listen to the radio uh, because why? Well, first of all, the radio isn't my choice, right? And they'll play songs. that's going to have words that I don't want. Even satellite radio, you know, it's not going to be of your choice. It's not going to be of your music that, that with the words, know every word. I was, there was this song that I, this catchy tune that was came out, I don't know, years ago. It was a catchy tune. I was like, wow, that's a great catchy tune. I started listening to it. And then I pulled up the lyrics and read the lyrics. It was about a school shooting. What? I'm like, okay, I am not putting that in my mind anymore, right? I, I, I've never listened to that. If it ever comes on, I'm like, uh, if it's somewhere within my earshot, I'm like, I'm out. I'm out because I don't want to feed my mind this. So I, that's, this, is, this is how people make money, right? They, they write songs about things that don't serve them or us. So being diligent about this, getting us back to nature, reverse engineer what we have today, get it, move it out of your life. If, if, if you're in the news all the time, I'm not saying being informed is a wrong thing, but believe me, um, there's more truth to a lot of things that were being presented than what we're seeing, right? I was, I was in, um, I think I was in Kentucky one time and uh, I got a phone call saying, oh my God, are you in a flood? I'm like, what? I was, it was raining, right? It was raining, but are you in a flood? Are you okay? What's going on over there? I'm like, what do you mean? I said, I I'm fine. So, well, no, the national news, national news is saying it's flooding. And they have this picture of this guy with the wind and the gale force, you know, it waves and stuff. And I'm like, 
no, I'm, uh, can you hear the wind? Nope. I don't hear any wind. <laughs> it was like, but th this happens. So it's until we actually are in the environment in which, you know, these statements are being made, we, we believe perhaps what we're seeing. So um, here's, here's what I wanted to try to convey tonight was just back to nature, um, back into a frequency of, of mind and body that's healing itself taking our power back and believing knowing knowing that there's a divine intelligence in in each of us every second and all we have to do is decide that that's true and be diligent about what frequencies we feed it that's it that's it what do you think Lori? 100 percent. and you know talking about watching or not watching the news i stopped watching the news Oh my goodness, probably 25 years ago. And I, I held the intention that if there was ever anything that was super important that I needed to know about, I would figure it out or I would find out in a timely fashion. And we were talking earlier about 9-11. I wasn't watching the news. I didn't know the first tower got hit. But guess what? I had three phone calls before the second tower was hit. Because everyone I know knows I don't watch the news. So it wasn't a problem at all. I actually had turned on the TV and saw the second tower get hit. It's, it's that easy. Just hold the intention that it's going to be okay to be different, that it's going to be okay to take a different stance. And, and everything will fall into place with grace and ease. That intention, that creation of, of watching the news, that addiction to watching the news typically falls under that category of I need, by the way, I need right. to know, I, I need to know, I need to know. And that, remember, that's one of those things that is a built in, it doesn't just, uh, it doesn't just pertain to news, because when we feel the need, um, and, and I, I totally believe what Lori said, because first of all, let's say that Worst case scenario happens. Can you stop it from where you are in this present moment, in your state of being? Can you stop it? It's already happening, right? Whatever it is. Now, I say prepare yourself for life, to live. Prepare yourself to live. What do you need to live? Put it together, keep it, hold it, honor it, cherish it. But if we stay on board with something that's happening a half a world away, and what's it do? It's, it creates a state of being into the sympathetic nervous system of fight or flight, and now we're not healing. And you're no good to anybody unhealthy. Like the steward or stewardess says on the airplane, put your own oxygen mask on first and then assist others. You're not going to be any good passed out. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? So, you know, there's not a possibility that you guys are getting out of here with not, me not suggesting to you that perhaps creating an intention in your Healy coaching module to have perfect health might be beneficial. Do you think? Just possibly, just possibly. Okay. And you, most of you who know me and how I coach and how I set intentions you know that I'm always writing pretty lengthy intentions because I really what? want you to get out of your head and into your heart and feel the way you're going to feel when you're in that state of perfect health. Izzy is laughing at me. I love you too, honey. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, so, we, we, I think it's important that we understand that we have a device here. Right? We have a technology here that creates very specific patterns to get us outside of those other specific patterns that we don't need, we don't want, we don't like. Right. So moving out of patterns, this is this is what creates these neural networks is patterns. When you have an initial brand new thought, it builds synaptic connections because there's not a pattern for it to already be within. Right? Everything is a frequency. And we have a rehearsed thought pattern. It's a neural network bundle that's been built over years. Right? We, can, we can prune that. 
we can prune those synaptic connections and rewire that. This is a neuroplasty brain. It's, it's, it's adaptable. So intentions. How many of you guys have the Soul Cycle program, the Soul Cycle page on Healy? Yes. So there's a happy program on there. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So understand we have a tool here. And, and we like to suggest different programs um, to get beyond some of these limiting beliefs. And so that's my favorite right there um, on the mental balance page, right? Soul well-being. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my, why? Where's the wisdom of you? It's not in that brain. It's in your soul. The soul's wisdom is millions of years old, right? It's, it's got the answer. All we need to do is open our heart, open our heart, let that soul peer into our lives and guide us, right? That's the wisdom of, of these beings of us is our soul. So that's, I love soul well-being. I use it a lot. Lori, what's Absolutely. your? Uh, uh, soul well-being is fabulous. And if, for those of you who have or are getting the Mag Healy very soon, you want to run the Earth program. Why? Because it vibrates at the frequency of the Schumann resonance, yep. which is 7.83 hertz, which is putting our body into a state of coherence with the planet. We actually tested this at the homecoming event. Sham Nam had everybody who had a Magheli, and there were probably 80 to 100 in the room actually set their devices at the same time to the Schumann resonance. And we move from all this heady stuff everybody been talking about into the space of our hearts and into this state of love that you could absolutely positively feel the energy in the room shift. It was palpable, absolutely palpable. So I would say do that for sure get your entire home vibrating at 7.83 Hertz because the Schumann resonance has been all over the board. So you could be running that program every single day, every single day. The Schumann resonance doubled about 20 years ago and the average is right around 15 or 16 now. And it spikes up into the 80s, 90s, 100s. I've seen it go as high as 150. So you want to constantly be recreating, at least in your own home environment or office environment or wherever you spend a bulk of your time, an environment that is in a state of coherence. Absolutely. And you're going to write an intention on perfect health. Mm -hmm. I am happy, healthy, vibrant, strong and stable of mind, body, and spirit. I am grateful to be feeling more peace and balance at all times. I process my emotions with grace and ease and experience more peace, love, and joy. I am living a life that brings me joy. My body is a pure, healthy, free-flowing vessel. I enjoy my strong immune system that is always working at an optimal efficiency level. Good healing, restorative sleep is my norm. My energy level is optimally balanced and I feel fantastic. And when you get into that space of actually experiencing and feeling that, then you hit run analysis on your coaching module. And you will find everything that's between where you are and that new timeline of where you're going in that state of perfect health. You'll find everything in between that is blocking you, that you aren't even aware of that's going on in your subconscious, much of which, as we know, is going to be coming from your parents, grandparents, ancestors, belief systems that were lovingly or not so lovingly gifted to you <laughs> that are wreaking havoc in your subconscious that you aren't even aware of. And then we have the beauty of vibrating those frequencies loose. And why do we wanna do that? Because 90 to 98% of the time, you are reacting based upon subconscious programs. So please promise me, you will do everything you can to get those things offline and vibrate 
those old beliefs out of the way. We have a gift, people, a huge gift. As you've heard me say before, I can find in six minutes what it used to take me six, six months working with someone one-on-one -on -one to find. Don't let that program go to waste. And if you don't have it, for God's sakes, get it immediately. Mm -hmm. So some of you guys that love that affirmation, remember this is going to be recorded. So um, so we can, and, and of course, Lori always gives all kinds of fun little gifts for the email group. And <laughs> maybe you'll see that affirmation, right? <laughs> there it is. So um, I, I hope you guys found some kind of value uh, in understanding how you take your power back, how to get back to the natural state of, of human being human. There's a natural state of us. Um, and, and I think, I believe I, I've taken on uh, the, I don't know, the, it's not really a challenge, but the vision of, of giving more information around that natural state so what we talked about tonight um how explain to others try to look back at your notes and go listen to this recording again and look at what i call the flow chart just take a look at how things flow how you create uh, at a at a very diligent genetic level and then and test it i invite everybody to test it uh, and, and then what we do is when we test it, we find value in it. It becomes a truth for us, but here's the key. Once we find a truth for ourselves, it's our duty obligation to share it with others. And when they can duplicate that same truth in themselves, guess what? That becomes wisdom. Okay. So let's start spreading some wisdom. How's that sound? <laughs> the heart heart wisdom soul wisdom oh my yes. gosh all right guys I so think we encourage you all to put on your calendar monday june 10th and join us again monday, for july. Oh, july july did i put june july yeah i'm sorry my my bad july 10th thank you for catching that yeah. i can't the problem is honestly you guys my brain is like, how can it be June already? <laughs> I still feel like I'm in May. So much has happened in the first six months of this year that it's like happening so fast. It's crazy. So July 10th. Yes, July 10th. And of course, we'll get emails out to all of you and all that jazz, but put that on your calendar so you don't forget. Absolutely. It's been a fun one. Uh, let's find our natural state and spread it out there and propagate across the world. All right. We love you guys. Thank you for joining us again. Until next time, remember, we love you. Mwah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Oh, you're so welcome.